Okay, thank you very much for the invitation. It's a great pleasure to be with you this morning to talk about the portfolio of new medicines that we have, uh, both for malaria control and eventually for its eradication. The talk I am going to give today will cover four areas. First of all, talking about the products we have and the impact those have on children's lives. Uh, the way we find new medicines, uh, give you a few case studies, how we can speed up clinical development, and finally, how we can get open data to encourage sharing. So quick introduction to Medicines and Malaria Venture. We were established in 1999, so 16 years ago, uh, to catalyze the discovery, the development, and the delivery of safe and affordable anti-malarial drugs. Uh, we're a non-profit, what's called the Product Development Partnership, which means we partner with groups throughout the world, uh, both academic uh, and industrial, both scientific and medical groups, to bring forward new products. And I'll talk forward through some of the products in a little while. Malaria itself is one of the leading causes of child mortality. Um, the number of cases and the number of deaths is falling, but the, st the statistics are still quite staggering. Uh, 438,000 deaths per year, uh, 214 million cases per year, with half the world's population at risk. The big challenge is that three quarters of the patients are actually children under five. Half of them are children under two. Uh, but also that the disease, because the parasite concentrates in the placenta, is actually targeting expectant mothers, pregnant women. In some of Sub-Saharan Africa, then something like 40% of the health budget is eaten up by malaria control and treatment. And the UN Special Envoy's Office has calculated that if we do manage to er eradicate malaria, the value creation to the world is over $200 billion between now and 2035. So the significant fact is one child still dies every minute from malaria. We just talk quickly through the, the parasite life cycle for malaria. First of all, you get bitten by a mosquito, a female mosquito, um, and she passes uh, what's called the sporozoite, so the infectious form of the parasite, from her salivary gland uh, into the bloodstream. That goes through the, the lymph ducts uh, into the liver, where it goes through a hepatic stage, uh, usually over five or six days. Although in some forms, particularly the Asian form, there is a dormant stage where there are reservoirs uh, called hypnozoites, where the parasite can actually stay for years and years and years without an effective uh, mosquito bite and then emerge. Okay, after that it explodes into the bloodstream and you get this periodic fever that is caused by the fact that the parasite takes 48 hours to go around the life cycle in the erythrocyte and explodes out. And it's that explosion of new parasites uh, and death of red blood cells that causes the periodic fever. Obviously then the, the immune system either brings the, the infection under control or the patient uh, goes into severe malaria, cerebral malaria, and dies. From the parasite perspective, it has to get out. And the way it does that is it goes through sexual forms called gametocytes, which are then taken up by the, the next mosquito uh, in her blood meal. If we want to stop malaria, uh, there are a number of ways we can do it. Classically, uh, drugs, as in the bottom left, would treat the fever, the symptoms the patient has, uh, or the parasitemia. More and more than uh, for drugs, then we're interested in actually stopping the, the parasite getting into the bloodstream, chemo protection, uh, or as I said, preventing the relapses of the forms in Southeast Asia. So that's liver stage drugs. The changes that were brought about by thinking about malaria eradication is that we think a lot more now about transmission blockade. So can you stop, bizarrely, the mosquito being infected by the humans? Because that's the real choke point. Uh, it's much easier to stop a mosquito being infected by humans than vice versa. Okay, so to, to anchor what we're talking about, then it's good to talk about what the current malaria medicines are. Uh, we have what's called artemisinin combination therapies, which are fixed dose combinations of a derivative of artemisinin on the left, so a Chinese natural product uh, from sweet wormwood, and actually, another derivative of the natural product, so we have quinine on the right. We don't use quinine, but we use derivatives. So quinine was modified to chloroquine in the Second World War, and now we have things like piperoquine, lumefantrin. but all working via the same mechanism. The challenge with what we could call the old drugs, the existing drugs, is more how we get uh, not just efficacy. Uh, combinations like this are efficacious 98% uh, of the time in large studies. Uh, but how we can get stability combinations of drugs which are stable in African conditions, so 75% humidity um, and stable for three years, affordable, uh, UNICEF prices are 25 cents an infant, uh, it would be really nice to get those numbers lower. Remember, chloroquine uh, 
it used to cost 10 cents. And again, optimizing the dose and formulation for smallest children. Those of you who tried feeding bitter medicines to two-year-old children will know that taste masking formulation is really important, especially if we're to be sure that the child takes the whole dose. And remember that subdosing uh, is going to be linked to adverse clinical outcomes, the patient doesn't get better, uh, but also the spread of resistance. We currently have five artemisinin combination therapies, so five different partner drugs out there. Uh, treating a couple of hundred million patients a year. Um, the beauty of having lots of different partner drugs in there is that different patient groups respond in different ways, but also it gives us uh, some protection against resistance. Um, we do start to see resistance to some of the partner drugs out there in the world. A question that comes up a lot in a presentation like this is drugs or vaccines. Obviously, eradication of a disease, uh, you can see in the top corner, you know, polio or yellow fever, much easier if you have a vaccine. But it is important to say that malaria is primarily a T-cell response, not an antibody response, and that the antigens are not particularly stable. Uh, so we're in that group where developing a vaccine is a major, major, major challenge. Uh, and in the meantime, the question is, can you use drugs to protect people instead of um, just treating them? In fact, we know that you can. You know, we use drugs when we go to malaria endemic areas. Um, now we're using more and more drugs to protect children in Africa. Uh, so what's called seasonal malaria chemoprotection. If you give a child a drug throughout the malaria season, you can reduce all-cause mortality by 60% for about $4 a year per child. So don't forget, drugs can be chemoprotective. So what's the problem? We have nice drugs, they work. Uh, one of the problems is that we're dealing with anti-infectious uh, arena of drug development. So resistance will always come up. So this is a slide from 2009 from Arian Dondorp's group showing that in Western Cambodia they were starting to see a decrease in the killing rate of the parasite, so going up from four hours to six hours. Um, that's now been confirmed by a number of groups. The question at the time was, is it going to get any worse? And the answer is it has got worse because it's spread a lot from Western Cambodia. However, the, the parasite phenotype, this uh, twofold shift in, uh, in killing rate, hasn't changed too much. In the last couple of years, we've now got uh, cell biology assays, so-called wing stage assay, and we've also got the molecular characterization. Uh, it's a mutation in the Kelch gene, Kelch 13. So then when we talk about the eradication of malaria, uh, the Gates Foundation put their muscle behind, uh, Melinda French Gates actually said, you know, we want nothing less than global malaria eradication. The reason she said that was to say, otherwise all we do is control, so we, we keep malaria at the distance, but we never get rid of it completely. This was supported in 2007 by Margaret Chan at WHO, who said, we'll put the resources of the WHO behind this, and I dare you to come along with us for the journey. So this is not a short-term plan. Uh, this is a 20-year plan for getting rid of malaria across the planet. If we talk about the sort of drugs we need to eradicate malaria, therefore, we can come up with what are called target candidates and target product profiles. And these are all published. But say we need drugs that kill the parasite fast, because the patient wants to get better fast. But we also need drugs that hang around for a long time to make sure every last parasite is gone. I talked a bit before, we want to make sure that the drugs don't stimulate the gametocytes, the transmissible form. And finally, that they do cure the patient completely of all the dormant reservoirs of malaria, so that we don't have parasites emerging a couple of years later. Ideally, we should be able to go from three days down to one day. Um, that's a big ask, because that means giving all the dose at once. Uh, and we need to be active against not just the resistance strains that are out there, but the resistance that might come up in the future. And we need to remember that children are our target population, so we need to have child-friendly medicines from the beginning. So how do we find these medicines? Well, there are a number of ways you can do it. The first, which is classical medicinal chemistry, is you can build on something you know works. So we know artesanate works really well, it kills fast, the problem with it is that it's a natural product, which means it's currently sourced from, uh, from growing Artemisia trees. If I want a ton of Artemisin in, it takes 18 months from the farmer deciding to plant the trees to actually harvesting. So we looked at it and we said, well, can we make a molecule that looks like Artemisin in and actually does what Artemisin does, but is fully synthetic? So that's the middle drug, uh, OS277, developed by Jonathan Benestrom up there. Um, and finally developed and commercialized by Rambaxi. So that's a molecule that does roughly what artemisinin does uh, at a much lower price, a little bit lower price, uh, but without this problem of price fluctuations, 
and knowing that if you want a ton of it, then it takes you six weeks to get it. We've been looking at how you can get uh, better than that. So we have the next generation called OS439. You can see that the molecules are pretty similar. Uh, in this case, we've managed to improve the safety. Uh, our test nate is actually um, has issues that uh, it can't be given in first trimester pregnancy yet because uh, of concerns about embryo safety. Uh, also, um, clinically, then it's uh, dose-limiting toxins, granular sites. So again, going for basically heme iron. Uh, we've managed to, to work out some of those wrinkles, and we've also managed to come up with something that's a synthetic peroxide, and it overcomes our testinate resistance, so fully active. So that's one way you can do it. Second way you can do it is you can find a molecular target and then you can design something. So this is the sort of thing that I like. Um, I'm a structural biologist by training. So this is work by Meg Phillips at UT Southwestern uh, up there and her team. Uh, collaboration between Dallas, um, the Swiss Tropical Institute and Monash, which is where the DSM comes from. So they did a high throughput screen and came up with this, uh, this molecule, which is on the left-hand side. Um, and from that did some medicinal chemistry, obviously the naphthylamine uh, in there is, uh, is a no-no from a chemistry point of view because it's carcinogenic. Um, so we came up with the middle molecule, um, DSM-191. You can see how the structural biology, uh, the crystal structure of that is up on the left-hand side. And you can see that uh, there's a big hole on the far left-hand side which needs to be filled, so by that five, uh, five position on the ring. And in fact, with UT Southwest and actually help from Glaxo Medicinal Chemists, they actually designed the final molecule which has that um, uh, difluor ethyl group on the right hand side filling the pocket. Again, the optimization is a little bit about improving the efficiency against the enzyme, but there was an awful lot of working on how to prove the efficiency uh, in terms of metabolism, how to get a drug that will hang around for a long time. That compound is also in phase two. Um, and in the body, it will hang around for a week or so, which is what we're, we're trying to get to. The third way, and this is where the real revolution took place, was uh, to go back to the way drug discovery was done 50 years ago and just ask the parasite. Uh, so starting in 2007, working with GSK, Novartis, St. Jude's, and then a whole raft of other companies, um, we were able to screen compound decks from those companies against the whole parasite. Uh, some of that inside the company, some of it with uh, Vicky Avery, who's shown uh, uh, as the second picture along. The reason we could do that is the price of screening dropped from maybe $200 a point to $1 a point. So screening a million compounds suddenly became practical. Uh, what surprised us was that hit rate against the parasite, so compounds that you just screen naively against the parasite in a red blood cell, um, the hit rate was just less than 1%, so quite high. So we screened 5 million compounds originally, we got 25,000 hits, and we were able to work out some um, medicinal chemistry strategies for moving them forward, and identify the targets at the same time. So that when we started, we really didn't know what the targets were. And that surprised us, because in the end, we ended up with new compounds for chemical development, and clinical development, and also new molecular targets. So let me give you the, the first example. So this is a spiroindolone from Novartis. So the, the left-hand compound you can see is this uh, quite complicated structure, spiro because of that, that ring junction. Now that was a singleton hit, so only one hit in the, in the screen. It was then worked up to this, uh, this middle compound, slightly more potent, a little bit unstable in microsomes, which was then worked up to the final 609 uh, compound on the right-hand side. Stable in microsomes, quite active in the mice, move forward into humans. So that's also in phase two studies, that's in clinical development at the moment. What was important was that that compound could then be used to identify the molecular target. And the target turned out to be PFATP4, which is a sodium channel. And that's where we started to, to really wake up because that target had been proposed before, but people generally don't try, like to work on ion channels unless they have some validation. So in fact, hardly any work had been done on that particular channel in the last 20 years. And it turns out to be the most important channel, uh, certainly in terms of phenotypic screening going forward. Let me give you an example. So, so far we've, we've got about eight new targets from parasite screening. Um, more come out at the rate of one or two per year. Uh, so you can see here that the ATP4, that sodium channel, has come out from a number of projects. Uh, we have a cyclic amine resistance locus, uh, DHODH I showed you, uh, we have a kinase. <laughs> Everybody likes kinases. It turned out that the only kinase that nobody had ever proposed working on uh, before the phenotypic screen 
uh, was PI4 kinase, the lipid kinase. Um, that was the one the parasite told us it's Achilles heel against. And bear in mind, we have not just compounds going into clinical development with these targets, but then we have the mutations that we're looking for. So very powerful combinations. Of course, one of the things that we're really interested in is compounds that we can never generate resistance against, and we have a couple of those now. The other thing we do is we have a wide network of different assays across different academic and industrial groups to test all throughout the life cycle stage where do these compounds act. So we have a number of compounds that are interesting and that way we get objective data from different people. Remembering that you know, in the end when a group tests its own compound then it's like testing your own children you tend to come up with much better results. So here we can fingerprint all the compounds uh, through our networks and see which compounds are working really well in which assays. So then the question is how can we speed up clinical development? Uh, for that I need to talk you through a little bit uh, the challenge. When we've discovered a nice molecule, when we've optimized it chemically, we take it into preclinical development. We show that that's safe and uh, is safe enough to be given to humans in what we call phase one or human volunteer studies. After that we do a phase 2a, a proof of concept study in human patients. And then for malaria, we always put two drugs together in combination. And we do that to protect the drugs against resistance. But that adds a little bit of complication. Uh, so we do a phase 2b study where we put the drugs in combination. And that's the first time we'll really be testing in children. Uh, remember, children are our target group, but they're very susceptible. They're very fragile. And also, they have no immune protection. And then finally, we go on to phase 3 where we have a couple of thousand patients and we do the, the pivotal studies. After the filing with the regulatory agencies, we have phase four, um, which is then looking to see how they work in the field. It's really important to know early on whether compounds are going to be successful. Uh, what we know is that most drugs actually fail the first time they see patients. So that's 36% success rate across the whole of industry for infectious diseases the first time patients see drug. Here's an illustration of why. This is a classical phase 2 for malaria that we did um, with OS439. You can see that uh, you have falciparum on the left side, Vivax on the right side, you have parasites coming down, you have different doses of drugs. And effectively, after 36 hours, nobody has any parasites anymore. So you could say 200 milligrams, absolutely brilliant. What happens, though, is that the parasites have gone below the level of detection by microscopy, but there are still 10 million parasites in the body. Even if you do it by PCR, there's still... 10,000, 100,000 parasites there. And the question is, when do the parasites come back? Are you on that green line where they go all the way to zero, or on the yellow line or the red line where you haven't actually got rid of them all and they come back after 6, 8, 10, 20 days? To study that, we have two ways. On the right-hand side, you could look at patients. So we tend to look at Thai patients uh, where we have adults that haven't seen much malaria. And you can see there that there's a, a good experiment with OS439, turns out, 100 milligram dose, and you can see that after a few days uh, the parasites are gone, but you start to see noise that some of them are thinking about coming back. The other thing that we've done, which is much more efficient, is done exactly the same experiment but with Australian volunteers. So we take healthy human volunteers and we give them blood stage infections and malaria. Now that may sound crazy, but remember that the Australians have no comorbidity, so they don't have any other diseases. They have no immune protection, so they're the worst possible case. They're just like really small children, but they're fit and healthy. And so it's much better to test on Australian volunteers. Can you really kill the parasite to get data on what happens if you have no immune protection than to go into small children early on? The other advantage is we can do that Australian volunteer study in two or three weeks. Uh, the Thai patient study would take us two years to organize and to carry out. So one of the things we've looked at is can we actually do these clinical fingerprinting, so going around the life cycle, can we have human experimental models at each stage? And the answer is, without going into the detail, yes we can. Um, it speeds up our development process because it means that really early on, just after the start of phase one, we can do a challenge cohort and then we know, is our drug going to work? That's that sort of uh, early confidence to move things forward. If you look at the pipeline, then the pipeline, this is the pipeline as it was in 2008, so there's quite a lot in there, but a lot of those compounds were actually drugs that have been around for a while, uh, 20, 30 years. If we look now, this is a 2015 slide uh, from a nature review we did, 
you can see that actually two things. One is the pipeline is a lot richer. You can see all those purple products, which are the ones I was talking to you about. So new products that we brought on the market in the last five or six years. Secondly, you can see on the left-hand side, all of the molecules to the left of the blue line are things that have come out in the last decade. So there are lots of new molecules, but also lots of new targets. Set against that, I put some success rates. Um, so those are the clinical success rates. So if you want to look how strong the portfolio is, divide the number of drugs in each column by the success rate. And you'll see, you know, if we want five or six drugs to come out of this, uh, we still need a lot more in the portfolio. So in the review, we titled the review A Glass Half Full, you know, are you optimist or are you pessimist? Um, and it's important to look through the portfolio and say, well, actually, we have quite a lot of new blood stage killers. We're doing pretty well for that. For chemo prevention, probably about a third of our drugs do that, so slightly less well. For transmission blocking, we're just starting to measure that clinically, but it's looking quite difficult. And for relapse prevention, the p vivax the, uh, the Asian form, we have a drug in phase three, but that's it. So that's the optimist view. If you say you take the pessimist view, the other problem is that as we look towards eradication, our drugs have to face tougher goals. So when we talk about blood stage killers, normally you'd say clinically we want something that treats a child. Now we have a problem for malaria eradication that we're trying to treat subclinical infections. So we have to get rid of every parasite from everybody. And in Africa, you have a lot of people wandering around with um, basically the parasite living in their body with no obvious fever. Right? You can debate whether they have any obvious signs, uh, increased anemia and so on. But Basically, we need new drugs which are safe enough to be given to people without obvious symptomatic malaria. Uh, that's a major stretch. When we talk about chemo prevention, you know, there are drugs out there that you and I can take which have to be given every day. The new drugs we're looking at are safe enough to be given once a week. What the clinicians want is something which can be given once a month or once a season. Uh, that's a big ask for a small molecule. Then looking at transmission blocking, can we have new molecules which could mean that we can block transmission completely back to the, the mosquito? Remembering that, you know, we can say children might sleep under bed nets, but most of them don't, not all of the time. So if we then say, um, moving forward, what have we learned in the final section about the importance of data? And this moves beyond malaria. So those of you who have no interest in malaria at this stage uh, can wake up. One of the things that we saw was that um, we had 25,000 hits. Uh, we put all of the structures of the hits that we could, so probably about two-thirds of them, the structures went out into PubChem. And we thought that that would be really exciting for people because lots of people had complained that there was no available chemical material, no, nothing was in the public domain. So we did that, and not much happened. So we went around and asked people, what do you really need? And what they said is, we need physical compounds. So we put together a compound collection called the Malaria Box uh, over the last two years, which is 400 compounds from the clusters of compounds which we'd found in our, in our screens. Those have been shipped to 200 research groups, so we made it available to everybody. Um, the project is now closed because we got rid of all of the boxes. Uh, we had requests from all over the world from people who work on malaria, who work on other diseases. And what was interesting is we started to see that hits against malaria also hit other communitoplastid diseases, uh, related parasites, but also quite distantly related parasites. We've also been able to use this to empower research groups in uh, disease endemic countries because quite clearly people have good biology, but they don't necessarily have good access to chemistry resources. We've now come up with a second generation project where we've taken the hits of all of the screens against pathogens. So not just malaria pathogen, but related pathogens, such as the one that causes Chagas or Leishmaniasis, also tuberculosis, and create a new box of 400 compounds. So this is now available at the moment. You can actually request it at pathogenbox.org. And by distributing it free on request and asking people to publish the results, and what we found is it's encouraging the sharing of information and moving projects on. So we are starting to see projects going into hits to leads, uh, going into optimization for other therapeutic areas. And that's been very, very exciting to see. So if you have an interest in this, and it's not just for malaria people, like I said, it's for related pathogens. Basically, if you're looking for a, te a test set of 400 compounds to test, these are the ones to do. Knowing that we have all sorts of other interesting metabolic data but also we know what they do against other parasites. So I've covered four areas. I've talked a little bit about products, a little bit about finding new medicines, 
a little bit about how you can speed up clinical development by using human challenge models and hopefully whetted your appetite a little bit to go and look at our website and have a look at some of the stuff we're doing on open data. As I said, MMV is a product development partnership. Uh, it's clear over the last 10 years. We're a small organization with 60 people, but the amount that we get done is tremendous because of the partnerships we have. And that's not just the partnerships with the disease endemic countries and the patients, it's also the research partnerships pulling together networks of like-minded people to develop drugs. And the final thanks are obviously to our patients and to their families. Um, that's quite, humil quite humbling when you say, you know, our patients, their parents, their grandparents, uh, but also the people who pay for all this. So you can see here there's a wide range of different governments. There are foundations like the Wellcome Trust and the Gates Foundation, uh, but even private companies who work. But to say, finally, our partnerships with everybody are what brings forward the next generation of new medicines. So thank you for your time.